Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Stefan will start the briefing right after I finish, so please remain on the line. At a virtual event this morning uh, to commemorate the International Day uh, of Remembrance and Tribute to the Victims of Terrorism, the President of the General Assembly said that the day presents the international community with a moment for reflection and opportunity to honor the memories of the innocent civilians who have lost their lives as a result of terrorist acts. Mr. Tijani Mohammed Bandi added that terrorism in all forms and manifestations can never be justified and acts of terrorism everywhere must be strongly condemned. He pointed out to the fact that the General Assembly has adopted resolutions to curb the scourge of terrorism and has worked to establish and maintain peace and security around the world and uphold the freedoms and human rights of the people we serve. He added that we have worked to strengthen cooperation, to prevent and combat terrorism, to address impunity and pursue accountability for the perpetrators and supporters of acts of terrorism. Mr. Mohammed Bandi thanked the survivors of acts of terrorism who joined the conversation today for their courage in speaking about their experience and said, on this International Day, we recommit to amplifying your voice, supporting your needs, and upholding your human rights. In his remarks yesterday to the Fifth World Conference of Speakers of Parliament, the President of the General Assembly said that the practical support provided by the Inter-Parliamentary Union, IPU, to its member parliaments since 1889 is crucial to promoting peace, democracy, human rights, gender equality, youth empowerment, and sustainable development through political dialogue, cooperation, and parliamentary action. The president pointed out to the successful adoption of a declaration on parliamentary leadership for more effective multilateralism and said that a lot of ground was covered across the various work streams during the conference. He commended the candid exchange of views on various issues, including climate change, migrants and refugees, and counterterrorism. The president said that effective parliaments around the world make a difference in our lives as they are at the heart of inclusive decision-making, shaping policies, and making laws which respond to the needs of all citizens. The statement is on our website. And yesterday, the President of the General Assembly convened an informal meeting with the current and incoming chairs of the main committees and the President-elect of the 75th session of the Assembly. The President said, as we gather here today, we are still dealing with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. In order to ensure business continuity, the membership of the Assembly, alongside the Secretariat and other UN bodies, went to great lengths to find creative and innovative ways to move forward with the work of the organization. Mr. Mohammed Bandi pointed out to the unprecedented socially distanced elections of the Security Council, ECOSOC, and President of the 75th Session of the General Assembly back in June, and the adoption of 68 decisions and resolutions under silence procedure in the absence of in-person meetings. The President wished all the best to the President-elect, Mr. Volkan Bosker, as he steers the work of the Assembly during the upcoming session. And uh, one last thing, I would like to uh, flag that the President of the 74th session of the General Assembly will come and meet with you uh, in an end-of-session press conference on September 8th at 11 a.m. And that's everything for me, uh, from me. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. I will give a couple of seconds to the chat and then hand it over to Stefan. Okay, I don't see any questions on the chat. So thank you so much. Have a very nice weekend. And please don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. Stefan, over to you. All right, thank you. Just give me two more minutes and I will, uh, I will be with you. Apologies. Thank you.
there we go. I assume having sound would help. Um, so it is cl clearly Friday, and we've had a long week. Uh, so maybe if you, with your indulgence, uh, we will start again. Uh, this morning, the Secretary General said that the third commemoration of the International Day of Remembrance of and tribute to the victims of terrorism takes place while the world is in turmoil. Um, the vital services for, vict for victims, such as criminal justice, processes, psychological support, have been interrupted, delayed, or ended while governments focus their attention and resources on fighting the pandemic. This includes the first UN Global Congress of Victims of Terrorism, which has been postponed to next year because of the virus. Despite that, the Secretary General has said it is important to keep the spotlight on important, uh, on important issues. He said the UN will continue to support member states' efforts to draft, adopt, and adopt legislations and national strategies to help victims, adding that a call to move forward on the establishment of a voluntarily funded program to support member states to provide long-term durable assistance to victims. Victims should remind us every day of the importance of our counterterrorism effort, he concluded. Let us put in place measures that uphold their rights to justice, protection, support, and rehabilitation so they can rebuild their lives better, he said. Also speaking at the conference was uh, Mr. Voronkov, the Undersecretary General and Head of the Counterterrorism uh, Department. Our colleagues in uh, Mali report that yesterday evening a team of UN human rights officials from, peacekeeping mission, from the peacekeeping mission gained access to President Keita, as well as other detainees held by the mutineers since Tuesday. The mission continues to closely monitor the situation and reports that Bamako remains relatively calm with no major security incidents, despite the ongoing rally to support in support of the recent day's events. The UN mission reports that the CNSP, uh, which is the Comité National pour le Salut du Peuple, has ordered Mali's borders to be reopened, including the airport. Two UN flights took off today. We repeat our call to reject violence, to respect the rule of law, and to preserve the right of all Maliens, including those of the president and senior government officials who remain in detention. mentioned yesterday, we can confirm that the use of logistics on board hit by an improvised explosive device in the Gao region and uh, it came under attack by unidentified assailants. Four UN peacekeepers were injured, but others successfully repelled the attacks and the mission was able to successfully carry out medical evacuations for the injured. But, uh, turning to Lebanon, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that the first shipment of 12,500 metric tons of wheat flour from the World Food Program was offloaded at the port in Beirut yesterday. The shipment will help stabilize the national bread prices and supplies. The RFPs also distribute food for some 3,600 people. The World Health Organization has distributed 25 tons of personnel protective equipment, personal protective equipment to 25 hospitals receiving both trauma and COVID-19 cases in Beirut and surrounding areas. The UN Refugee Agency has distributed more than 2,500 shelter kits. And for its part, the UN Children's Fund and its partners are engaging more than 1,100 young people, including Palestine refugees, to clean and rehabilitate homes. And a quick funding update for you. As of today, $565 million appeal for Lebanon is 8% funded with a total of $43 million received. This amount is likely to increase as member states continue to report their contributions. And our friend, the High Commissioner for Refugees, Philippe Grande, has just wrapped up a four-day visit to Lebanon. He reaffirmed UNHCR's immediate support to the more than 100,000 people who were severely impacted by the blast in Beirut. During his visit, he saw the devastating impact of the blast and the Lebanese and refugee families. He also called on the international community to continue their generous support and stand by the people of Lebanon at this trying time. 
And one more item for you on Lebanon. Um, it's time to show to show how our peacekeepers are helping to address the COVID-19 pandemic and help people in the wake of the explosions. Peacekeepers serving with UNIFIL in southern Lebanon have donated four ventilators to intensive care and pulmonary units in public hospitals in Tyre in South Lebanon. And 100 peacekeepers have donated blood for the victims of the explosions. The initiative is organized in coordination with the Lebanese Red Cross seeks to address the gap in blood supplies. There was a similar event last week in the mission's headquarters during which, which nearly 100 other peacekeepers also donated uh, their blood. And turning to Yemen, we are told that uh, we, along with our partners, are unanimous in saying that we can, we can and are delivering principled aid across Yemen despite the challenges. The biggest problems that aid agencies are now facing is the lack of funds, of money. Uh, the acting De uh, deputy relief coordinator for the UN, Ramesh Rajan Singham, warned that the Security Council warned Security Council this week that key humanitarian programs are shutting down because of lack of funds. As you will recall, Liz Grande, the humanitarian coordinator, made a similar appeal later in the week. The humanitarian response plan for Yemen is only 21% funded out of $3.38 billion requested, the lowest funding level ever this late in the year. Much of this gap is due to the decreases in support from Yemen's neighbors in the Gulf. We call on all donors to pay outstanding pledges immediately and call on those who have not pledged or pledged less than last year to increase their support. Staying in that country, UNHCR says that some 300,000 people in the country have lost their homes, crops, livestock, and personal belongings in the last three months due to torrential rains and severe flash floods. Among those who are newly displaced are people who had already fled, to, already, had already fled due to conflict and who are once again having to rebuild their lives and communities. More online on UNHCR's website. And a quick Ebola update for you in the outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo's Equator province. The number of cases of Ebola in there have now reached 100, including 43 people who have died. The cases have also spread from the city of Mendaka to 11 of the province's 17 health zones. Dr. Uh, Matsushidi Mweti, the World Health Organization's regional director for Africa, said that with 100 Ebola cases in less than 100 days, the outbreak in Equator province is evolving in a very concerning way. WHO says the outbreak represents a significant logistical challenges. It can take days to reach affected populations with responders and supplies often having to traverse areas without roads and requiring long periods of riverboat travel. Most of the responders have been mobilized locally under the leadership of the Congolese government. There are currently 90 WHO experts on the ground, as well as experts from other 20 other partner organizations. Since the beginning of the outbreak, WHO has supported the vaccination of more than 22,000 people at high risk. Despite these efforts, WHO says the response is underfunded and there's a critical need for additional support. And we have another update from Burkina Faso. According to new estimates, about $3.3 million are currently, excuse me, about 3.3 million people are currently facing acute food insecurity. This is an increase of more than 50% since March. The FAO and the World Food Program are calling for urgent action. Two provinces in the Sahel region, Udalan and Sum, have been driven into emergency food emergency phase of food insecurity. Some three percent of people in these northern areas are said to be experiencing catastrophic levels of acute food insecurity. They face extreme food consumption gaps, also resulting in alarming levels of malnutrition. While urgent life-saving humanitarian assistance is needed to address the immediate problems, the agency says longer-term investments in rural livelihoods and social services are also essential, especially so they can help reinforce social cohesion and contribute to peace. And a quick update from South Sudan, where peacekeepers there continue to help local authorities in their fight against the COVID-19 virus. We've now donated 6,000 face masks to internally displaced people and the protection of civilian sites in Malakal and other locations. Together with our partners, the mission has also commissioned the local production of a large number of face masks to be given to displaced people and others in need. And turning to Latin America, a new strategy released, uh, excuse me, a new survey released today by the UN Migration Agency found that 
almost 60% of those intending to migrate decided to postpone or cancel their plans due to the pandemic. In addition, over 20% of those already living as migrants are considering returning to their country of origin as soon as the economic conditions or health measures adopted by their countries allow them to do so. About half of all migrants in Central America and Mexico lost jobs during the pandemic. More than 1,600 participated in this survey, which was launched in June to measure and understand the impact of the pandemic on migration plans. The survey also found that four out of 10 migrants with jobs, so their working hours cut or had wages reduced due to the virus. Okay, apologies again for the technical uh, issues, uh, but let's um, let's see uh, if we have uh, if we have any questions, uh, which I'm sure we do. Uh, okay, um, that's Toby. Oh, hi, Steph. I I wasn't first in the queue, um, but uh, my question is, um, does the Secretary General view uh, today as day one uh, for the sanction snapback process beginning? Look, the, the interpretation of the resolution of the timeline is, sorry, you're, you're breaking, are you still speaking? I can't hear you. No, I'm not, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, the interpretation of the resolution of the timeline is up to Security Council members. The Security Council members will need to interpret their own resolution. All right, Edie. Thank you very much, Steph. Um, I have a question about Libya. Um, as I'm sure you've read, uh, Libya's UN-supported government announced a ceasefire across the country today and called for demilitarizing the strategic city of Sirte. And that initiative was supported by the rival parliament in the east. Uh, does the secretary general have any reaction? Yes, uh, we, we very much welcome this development. It was also welcomed by uh, Stephanie Williams, our acting uh, special representative. And I'm waiting. We should. I, I was expecting a statement, but we'll have something uh, more official very shortly. Thank you. Okay, uh, Maria. Hi, Steph, um, everyone. Thank you. Um, so I have a question uh, regarding the meeting between SG and Mr. Pompeo. Um, yesterday, uh, as um, I saw a tweet from uh, US uh, Secretary of State about the meeting, where he's saying, sorry, and I wanted to read it correctly. Um, yeah, where he's saying that uh, they discussed the actions which SG must after post snap snapback uh, so I wonder what according first of all I wonder what they think about the voting because covering a lot of bilaterals I didn't see uh, when one party says to another what they must do and uh, according to us what what is SG part in this what SG which actions SG should take? Well, yes, the Secretary General, as you know, and as we told you, met uh, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo. Uh, the Secretary of State delivered to the Secretary General a uh, letter uh, regarding Resolution uh, 2231 concerning the implementation of the resolution. Uh, we gave that letter uh, to the Security Council Presidency, which was then circulated. Uh, as for, for the rest, again, uh, I'll repeat what I just told, uh, what I just told Toby which is it's for the Security Council members themselves to interpret uh, their own resolutions. It's not the Secretary General. Uh, yes, but uh, according to the tweet, the United States clearly expects some actions from Secretary General. So I just wonder what actions they expect. Well, I think you will have to ask them what they expect. But I can only say for us, uh, you know, the, the Security Council needs to 
interpret its own resol resolutions. Um, Abdel Hamid, and then um, and then Margaret, which I think I skipped. Thank you, Stefan. In fact, it thread my mind and then asked the same uh, asked the same question I was preparing to ask you. But since I have the floor now, I will ask you about the rising tension in Gaza. Uh, and for the last couple of days, there have been bombing by Israel the uh, of Gaza Strip. The Palestinian resistance will respond with uh, fire kites. Uh, is Mr. Mladenov involved in trying to calm things down and talk to the parties? Thank you. Yes, I mean, we're, we're very much not only aware, but I think we're, we're, we're concerned by the increased violence uh, that we're seeing in Gaza and in southern Israel. Uh, the launching of indiscriminate rockets, mortars, incendiary devices by Palestinian militants into Israel must immediately cease. We also urge Israel to exercise restraint in responding to these incidents. Israel's ban on fuel entering Gaza via Karem Shalom, including donor-funded fuel for humanitarian purposes, needs to be immediately reversed. As you know, there's uh, only one power plant in, uh, in Gaza, and it's shutting down its turbines. So we've seen reports of less than four hours of electricity available to many parts of Gaza. And that, you know, is a particular concern to us about the impact that this uh, reduced uh, electricity, electricity supply will have on health facilities, on schools, uh, and also on conditions at uh, the, some of the quarantine centers at the Rafa crossing. Um, these UN-supported centers are a critical element to the efforts to prevent an outbreak of COVID-19 in the Strip. Uh, the special coordinator, Mr. Mladenov, is working with all sides right now to try to ease tensions and, more most importantly, to prevent further escalation that may endanger the lives of Palestinians and Israelis alike and would only uh, deepen the already uh, critical humanitarian situation in Gaza. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Um, I, skipped, uh, I skipped a couple of people on my list, uh, Margaret and then Evelyn. Okay, can you hear me still? I can hear you. Right. There I am. Um, hi, so following up on Maria's question then, did the Secretary General tell Secretary Pompeo that the Security Council must interpret their own resolutions? Because he specifically said he gave him actions. So can you clarify? I, 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 the, the Secretary General's position is pretty uh, is pretty clear. It's the same in public uh, and in and in private, uh, and it's it's been for quite some time uh, at the UN. Uh, I have one more. If you have, if that was yes, please, go ahead. Uh, on uh, Mr. Keita, President Keita, what was his condition? I don't see anything on the MINUSMA website. Further. No, I, I have no, uh, all I, all, the information we have is that we were able to go and see him, which is good, but I have nothing to share on his, uh, on his condition. Could you try and get some more for us from yes. MINUSMA on that? Yes, ma'am. Evelyn, uh, please. Hi. Hello, Steph. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, while we're all very preoccupied with Iran and its desire to rearm, meanwhile, the UAE has received uh, an arms supply from the United States, and Saudi Arabia is planning a nuclear reactor. Has the Secretary General reacted to any of that? Look, uh, we've seen the reports of various uh, arms sales. I mean, as, as a matter of, so I have no specific comment on those uh, on, on those uh, on those developments. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, so I'm having a little trouble with my computer today. Uh, Michelle. Hey, sir. Um, sorry, to, hop, to hop on this, but it is Iran, Iran, Iran all the time. Um, has any country asked the Office of Legal Affairs for an opinion on whether the U.S. can trigger snapback? I'm not aware of any request. And would they grant such a request if it was made? I'm not going to go into hypotheticals. We get requests all the time. We, we try to fulfill them uh, mm -hmm. uh, as much as, as possible, but it, which doesn't change the bottom line for us. It's that it's the, the interpretation of Security Council resolutions is 
the job of Security Council members. Um, and just, just one quick one quick follow up, just to have another go on uh, previous questions asked by my colleagues. What did Pompeo ask the Secretary General to do? I think you will have to ask uh, the Secretary of State's office to give you to tell you what he asked. Um, Mr. Iftikhar Ali, and then we'll go to Iftisam. Uh, thank you, Stefan. As the time is running out, uh, do you have any update on the situation of this oil tanker of the Yemen coast? No, uh, we're, we're very much aware of the clock, uh, you know, of, of kind of a clock ticking. Uh, but we, we're continuing our discussions with, with all the relevant authorities. And as soon as we have something to share with you, uh, we will. Thank you. Um, it to some, and then Mr. Sato. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Uh, so I have a question on Iran, uh, but a technical sure, one. Sure. But before before that, something struck me in your uh, statement uh, regarding Gaza, um, Palestine, and Israel. So you said you 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 said that uh, uh, Palestinians should uh, practice. Uh, so the actions from Gaza should immediately uh, cease. And then in the same sentence, almost, you said that uh, Israelis should practice uh, maximum pressure regarding their attacks on Gaza. So... Maximum restraint. Maximum restraint, sorry. So don't you think that they, their action also should immediately cease? Look, we, we would like to see... Uh, we would like to see this cycle of violence, this current cycle of violence, end, and we call on the parties uh, to do whatever they can to, uh, to, uh, to reach that goal. Okay, so my question on Iran is then uh, a technical one, if you want. So what exactly is the role of the Secretary General? Why is, so is his role only just to get the proposal from, uh, not the, 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 the letter, sorry, from the Mr. P P Secretary Pompeo, and then to circulate it to the Security Council. Oh, that, that, is, that is a big job. I mean, that is part of the, the the responsibilities of the Secretariat in general is to make sure that the documents are circulated, that we receive letters, and we receive letters all the time with a request for them to be circulated as documents, and that is uh, that is being done. Uh, the you know the Secretary General has responsibilities in terms of 2231 reporting responsibilities which he has lived up to. Uh, but on the questions of, of the interpretation of, uh, of actions, that is up to the security party. So, the, the, if I may, a follow-up. We know, uh, and from all the uh, comments from the different uh, the two different parties, that the Security Council is not united in this issue. So, what's from your office point of view, what should happen next? What is the role of the Secretary General in this case? Well, they, they you know, we, we, we would hope that Security Council members engage in a, in a substantive and productive uh, discussion. But I, I can't, you know, I can't read the future. Uh, th this development, as we know, just, just happened. Uh, let's, we can only take it one day, uh, one day at a time. Um, uh, Mr. Sato, and then uh, Gloria. Thank you, Sato. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I mean, that yes. is just, you, the size of that mug, Iftisam, just, I don't know how much, how uh, much no. you have in there. Sorry, Sato, go it's ahead. It's a square in my computer. But, yep. um, my question is about uh, logistics. Uh, next Monday, uh, UN headquarters are uh, uh, coming to the phase two. Uh, which they uh, go up the uh, capacity of 40 percent. So, uh, do you expect uh, many more uh, the staffs come back to the UN, or still most of the keep most of them the keep uh, teleworking? Uh, you know, I think it'll depend. We the, the that is a ceiling. Uh, obviously, staff were able to still come. To, you know, who are for whatever reason, and those could be health reasons, could, those could be child care reasons, uh, transportation issues, that we'll need to continue to work from home. We'll continue to work from home. Uh, we're trying to, to, to reopen slowly. Um, 
with keeping in mind all the constraints that we all face, all of us face uh, at this particular junction. Just to give you a heads up, we will, um, next Wednesday and Thursday, we will try to have, uh, to test out hybrid in-person briefings. So mm -hmm. I expect to be in the briefing room Wednesday and Thursday uh, for, to answer questions from you in person if you're there. There's obviously a limited capacity in the briefing room. Uh, I think Tal will have the information on exactly how many people can come in. And I will be able to take questions um, it, both for in person and uh, through the WebEx. We're just, I wanted to test it out uh, as I think that will become the norm uh, starting in, uh, in September when we do expect to be a bit, uh, be, uh, for at least for my office, to be in the, in the building at a slightly uh, higher uh, level, not fully but it's slightly higher level. Um, Gloria, please. Yes. Uh, as press, I get these questions all the time. How can the various international corporations that have overflow of their manufacturing products, food, clothing, healthcare, vintage hospital equipment, what department in the UN should they contact? Because with the UN so closed down, the various foundations you could contact, there's silence, unfortunately. No, I mean, UN Foundation is very much working, and they are our biggest partner with the public sector. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, Dulce. Dulce? Not yet. Go ahead. Okay, so back to Iran, please. Uh, did the Secretary General share uh, information from this meeting with the Security Council members? Uh, I mean, Secretary General has been uh, is in regular touch with members of the Security uh, of the Security Council. Uh, whether or not he had specific debriefs uh, with about this, the meeting with Mr. Pompeo, I doubt he did. Um, but I, you, as you also know, the uh, Secretary of State met with the President of the Security Council uh, yesterday. So one would assume information would flow from there as well. Oh, okay. Also, did uh, Pompeo talk to the Secretary General about the possibility of President Trump coming on September 21st to the UN to speak? I'm not aware that that was raised by uh, the Secretary of State. Okay. It would be great if we could just some vague idea what they talked about besides well, they, the, that was the main point of the conversation what? uh was what? resolution 20 was resolution 2231 and for the secretary of state to deliver uh, uh maria did you have another question it was asked Thank you. it was asked. excellent uh, probably not answered but at least it was asked. uh okay anybody else have any questions Excellent. Uh, have a great weekend and see you all uh, Monday.